Good morning. Welcome to worship with Bethany Theological Seminary. Whether you are joining us today in Nye Carey Chapel or online, or are joining us at a later time online, we welcome you. My name is Joe Buell, and I am an EVDIV student at Bethany Theological Seminary. Today's sermon is being delivered by Maggie, Dr. Maggie Elwell, Assistant Professor of Peace Studies and Director of the Bethany Bold Program. We welcome her inspired words. Please rise in body or in spirit and join in the responsive call to worship in the hymnal number 671 or on the screen online and remain in this posture of praise for the invocation and the hymn. Oh God, we come seeking you in our worship together. We come to you for truth because we are untrue. We come to you for strength because we are weak. We come to you for wisdom because we are unwise. Move in our midst. Show us your truth, your strength, and your wisdom. Through Christ's Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please pray with me. O rock of ages, on you all authority rests. We invite you here in all your majesty, knowing that we are unworthy and flawed humans. We come with our jealousies and ambitions. We thank you for your grace and forgiveness when we fall short of the mark. God of time eternal, while we struggle with our daily schedules and hectic lives, as we work through the end of this semester, while the days are growing shorter and the nights longer, join us now and quiet our souls as we wait for the light to return. Come now, O Prince of Peace, amen. words from the 20th chapter of Luke. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and scribes came with the elders and said to him, tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Who is it that gave you this authority? He answered them, I will also ask you a question, and you will tell me, did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? They discussed with one another, saying, if we say from heaven, he'll say, why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, all of the people will stone us, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. Then Jesus said to him, 
Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. The word of God for the people of God. Jesus was a teacher who was invested in getting his students to think, to solve their own problems, to look to themselves for answers. In the story that Joe shared with us, Jesus attempts to lead the Pharisees to find some sense of their own authority, asking them a question that requires them to say what they believe. He's asking them to show some spine. The problem is that the Pharisees lack the courage of their convictions. They have thoughts, but they are too afraid of the reactions of other people to be able to say what those thoughts are. They're afraid of being exposed as hypocrites if they say one thing, and they're afraid of the reaction of the crowd if they say another. So they back down. They say, we don't know. They don't like the consequences of making a choice, so they decide not to decide. Or maybe they don't like tension, so they try to tuck the issue under the rug. Fence riders, we might call them. The slimy middle or simply passive. It's a fairly common problem, I think. People don't like the consequences, so they pretend they can't act. But the responsibility to act does not go away because we refuse it. The title of the sermon is, Answer the Question. A colleague of mine, a science teacher named Mrs. Harrison, back when I was an English teacher in Baltimore City, was a teacher who was invested in getting her students to think, to solve their own problems, to look to themselves for answers. She was once chaperoning our teenage students at a four-day-long science camp, and she had two nights in which she had to sleep in one of the girls' cabins. Only a couple of them had had her as a teacher. The rest didn't know her. She told the girls in the cabin that they were turning the light off at 11, and they could talk in their bunks until 11.30. After that, she told them, there will be no talking. You will be quiet and go to sleep, she said. That is a complicated standard to hold because it is very difficult to enforce the consequences. What can you possibly do other than yell or beg if a cabin full of teenage girls, predictably, don't want to stop talking and go to sleep. Faced with this problem, Harrison still believed that she had a responsibility to the girls in the cabin to ensure that they got a good night's sleep. So she made a decision to act. She said, Quanisha, which was the name of one of the girls, I can hear you the loudest, so I'm gonna make you a promise. If I hear you talking again, I'm going to get up, take your pillow, and throw it outside. Most of the girls thought that was funny. It was pouring, and who ever heard of a teacher taking away a pillow and throwing it in the rain? That sounded crazy. One of the girls who knew Mrs. Harrison said, Hey, Quanisha, you better stop talking. Harrison said, Go to sleep. Within two minutes, Quanisha was talking again. Harrison got up, took Quanisha's pillow, opened the cabin door, and threw it out in the rain. Then she shut the door and went back to bed. Whoa, one of the girls said. Okay, Harrison said, now go to sleep. She waited, she listened. No one said anything else until the alarm went off that morning. At breakfast, the vice principal asked Harrison if she had really thrown a student's pillow out into the rain. Yes, she said. I told the student that I would if she talked again after I'd said the time for talking was over. The vice principal shrugged and said, you got to do what you tell them you're going to do. And that was the end of it from him. Harrison told me that the other teachers in other cabins looked exhausted in the morning, saying that their students had finally dropped off to sleep around 4 a.m. The kids themselves, naturally, were not especially helped by getting only three hours of sleep. 
which was the calculation that Harrison had made in order to act. She thought kids need to get their sleep, they need to stop talking to get sleep, and then she decided what she was willing to do. I think that if Jesus had asked Mrs. Harrison a question about where she thought her authority came from, she would have been able to give him an answer. Quanisha, by the way, the student who lost her pillow in order to ensure she got a good night's sleep, decided that she liked Mrs. Harrison because she was real, because she was tough, which is often how that went. A clear standard followed by a sure consequence made Quanisha feel safe, which was especially important because she had lived in a situation where she was sexually and physically abused. Harrison, as an effective teacher who cared about Quanisha, didn't think that it was better to expect less or treat her like she wasn't capable because of that. Quanisha needed her teachers to set a standard, tell the truth, act with integrity, and expect the same from her. She needed her teachers to exercise their authority. There are lots of Quanishas in Baltimore City Schools. Many, many students come from not just difficult, but horrifying situations of abuse and neglect as a result of poverty, substance dependency, and what I call slow violence. Some of the streets are not safe, some of the houses are full up with lead paint, and the adults who have the capacity and skill to teach and parent are overworked, exhausted, and usually on the way to burnout. And the way to operate in that environment in order to lead a student to growth, which is how I define the work of a teacher, was through holding high standards and consistently enforcing consequences. Harrison could do something like throw a student's pillow into the rain in Baltimore City schools because there was a widespread acceptance of the goodness of exercising authority. Most people understood that our students needed clear rules and consequences if they were to have a hope of succeeding, by which I mean becoming a healthy adult. And a teacher's authority was therefore prized Good teachers operated strictly because of our students' extensive needs. To get rid of the needed consequences for students' choices was to be an ineffective teacher, and you would put everyone at risk. I wonder what Mrs. Harrison, who has long since retired, would say about the contemporary culture of higher education. It's a different understanding of needs altogether. Instead of knowing that our students' safety and growth comes from consistent, clear expectations and consequences, a number of people act as if leniency is the answer. The feeling is that it's better to let Quanisha and the rest of the girls in the cabin talk all night because to insist that they go to sleep is too much to ask of anyone, especially someone who has suffered like Quanisha had. The feeling is that Quanisha, in particular, because of the abuse she had suffered, is incapable of behaving appropriately and should not be expected to follow rules or accept the consequences of her actions. There's now a prevailing attitude in institutions of higher ed that leading Quanisha to health and self-control is impossibly overbearing, as if giving her the permission to languish is the best we can offer each other and those who depend on us. That view is wrong-headed. Harrison worried about Quanisha's ability to enact self-control, as we do with nearly all teenagers, but especially those like Quanisha, whose boundaries have been smashed to pieces through neglect or abuse. And she expected that she would have to show her how to behave over and over again. Harrison also thought that Quanisha would be healthier and happier if someone enforced a bedtime for her until she could do it for herself. For me, what has come out of teaching every age from fifth grade through middle and high school, undergraduates, graduates, and adults, and other kinds of continuing education, is a strong belief in the ability that we all have to grow, no matter what has happened to us or what we have done to ourselves or others. The mantra of the public school teacher is, 
all kids can learn. But I think Jesus would say with hope that it's really all people can learn. What we want most for Kwanisha and for all of our students is further steps down the road towards self-control, which leads to responsibility, which leads to the ability to support and influence others towards health and growth, which is a good use of authority. To do that, we need clear expectations. We need clear and consistent consequences. That's how growth happens. There are, of course, lots of obstacles in the way of growth. Some of those obstacles are put there by society, history, or families of origin. Some of them seem to fall on us from nowhere. Some of them we put there by what we do or don't do in our lives. And we know that there are many Kwanishas in many places. I don't think, for example, that there is less suffering among our students who are adults with sufficient means to apply to and then attend graduate classes than there was among our students in Baltimore. The amount of suffering is significant in both. I have heard about horrific abuse and unbelievable cruelty done to our students in both. I see students who react out of panic and fear in both. I don't think that we can successfully arbitrate among which groups of people suffer more or less in our society. It's simply the case that to be human is often to suffer terribly. And it's better to accept that than quibble about who is hurting the most. The blame or fault or circumstance of the suffering doesn't matter for what is still true about the inherent possibility and opportunity and responsibility for all of us to grow. The amount or cause of suffering does not negate our responsibility to act with integrity and decisiveness to help each other to grow. A traditional interpretation of the passage that Joe read for us is to criticize the Pharisees for not recognizing Jesus' authority. But that's not what's at stake. Jesus is not pointing to his own authority. He is providing an opportunity for the Pharisees to recognize how they are not exercising their own. And I think that a recognition of one's own authority while painful and sometimes frightening, that leads anyone to rethink how they use or don't use their own legitimate power is precisely what most of us need over and over so that we gain the awareness and ability to make decisions of consequence when asked a difficult question, to say what we believe is true, to hold ourselves and each other accountable for what we do and say as well as for what we do not, and to uphold the consequences of our actions and inactions. That is especially the case for people who sometimes choose inaction instead of real peace, and sometimes choose permissiveness over the hard work of love who sometimes confuse coercion with the responsible exercise of one's authority. Heed the call and reckon. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit and follow along on the litany on the screen. You will read the bolded text. Shepherding Lord, you lead us through the worst of times and places. Guide our world leaders to peace. Aid them when war threatens. Call them to sue for peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Loving God, you guide us through light and love. Encourage our national leaders to be inclusive of others. Comfort them when fear rouses our worst instincts, guide them to be wise and caring to all. In Jesus' name we pray. Pay 
patient God. You know the rising and the setting of the sun. Steady our local leaders when their many tasks threaten to overwhelm their calendars. Calm our local leaders when disasters strike. Help them to remember the poor. This name we pray. Steadfast rock, you uphold those who fall and stumble. Lift up our denominational leaders during these tumultuous times. Teach them to stand firm for justice. Strengthen them in their faith. Eternal Creator, you count every hair on our heads. Help us to keep your faith. Help all of us to share your compassion. Help all of us to go forth and serve with joy. Go now, empowered by God to envision new ways to serve others. Go now, authorized by God who supports you through every obstacle. Go now, as leaders who are confident that God is always with you. <laughs>